Neuf nouvelles, tout droit venues de Suède, précisément d'un petit village perdu, Blala Linden, à la frontière de la Laponie, c'est ce que fera lire « Sois sage bordel de Stina Stour », recueil paru aux éditions Marie Barbier. Ciselé, poétique, vivant, les textes de Stina Stour se déroulent en majorité à la lisière de l'adolescence. À cette époque ténue, on n'en est plus tout à fait un enfant et pas encore un adolescent, encore moins un adulte évoluant dans un monde menaçant et complexe. L'innocence et la violence voisine se nourrissent parfois et rencontrent même un écho surnaturel des plus inattendus. Stina Stour, lauréate de l'équivalent du Goncourt suédois, nous fait l'honneur de répondre à quelques questions en direct de Suède et sous la neige. Thank you for joining us for the 20th edition of Colère du Présent. We will talk about your, your book, Sois Sage Bordel, published in France by Marie Barbier. Uh, first of all, why did you choose to write short stories? Uh, it all began with actually being really poor, and I lived out here in a small red house, and the roof was leaking. And I had just given birth to a baby. And I saw this short story contest where you could win uh, 5,000 euros, sort of. Mm -hmm. And I sort of really needed that money. Uh, and uh, I won the competition. Everybody thought I was crazy. You know, I locked myself in to write a short story because I needed the money. And I remember my mother banging on the door, screaming, do I need to call uh, the emergency psychiatry? What's wrong with you? And I sort of said, I'm just writing a story. And she said, yes, that's what I mean. You know, like, uh, and even when I won the competition and I was supposed to go to the award ceremony mm -hmm. uh, and I tried to have my mother babysit because, you know, I couldn't bring baby uh, she said don't you know someone's just you know messing with you you didn't really win that was a prank call you know like oh. you shouldn't go to this uh, <laughs> so that's why i started writing short stories and then it continued that is actually the uh, the story that in swedish is called Farvordel. it was the first short story i ever write wrote about uh, Uh, a mother and a daughter who plants flowers on a grave and storm cleaning. Uh, and then at the award ceremony, there was this newly started publisher that asked if I could write a story for them. And I sort of said no, because, you know, it hadn't been that easy to get a babysitter and to, you know, get the time to get everything to work. And then they looked at me and they said, will pay in advance and I like oh cool I get paid before even if it's rubbish sort of you don't have to see it first and they were like yeah of course <laughs> so I wrote the second story or was like going to write the second story and then the Swedish radio called mm -hmm. and asked if I could write a story for them It's actually lots of snow. <laughs> yeah, it's really snowing hard. <laughs> uh, and I said, no, I can't. I just promised to write the story for this little publishing house. And I really can't take on anything else right now. And they said, but we'll pay in advance. And I sort of said, okay, then, you know, because I really, I didn't have a job. Actually, I, I didn't even finish school. So it's not that easy to get a job, to get money to. And all of a sudden, people liked what I did. Instead of only being this problem that was going to be fixed, mm -hmm. you know, there were people actually wanting what I had. And I, it was flattering and very stressful, but it was amazing, you know, an opportunity you only dream about. And I did those two stories. They are in the book as well. <laughs> uh, and um, I didn't know when I wrote for the radio that that was a big, you know, thing. And that a lot of established authors uh, did that. And, you know, there was this uh, 
uh, Swedish radio short story award that all of the established authors would compete about at the end of the year. And I won it. And I was the first non-published author to ever have won it. You know, the others were like important people. And I was just in shock. You know, those kinds of people don't even speak to people like me. It's, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, it went on from there. Mm, it was really the starting point with this yeah. life uh, chances and detail that go to yeah. and then you are made you a writer. It it went for just a few months in between that my mother was banging on the door and I tried to tell her that I'm just gonna, you know, give me one more day to finish this story, please. And she said, you know you obviously have a mental breakdown thinking that you can write to me getting two awards. Yes, it's been really qu quick. Yeah, it was, you know, it was like really quick and I could fix the roof and, and you know, everything. <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> and, and how would you describe your text, uh, your writing to someone who has never read you? How would you, which words would you use to describe your, your your writing, I think I would say it's very oh how would I describe my writing? I think it's a lot of magical fiction that is at the same time very close to my childhood you know growing up here all of the stories are set in in these parts of sweden mm -hmm. where i grew up uh, in the small villages and and it's very to some people you know there's absolutely nothing here I remember moving into this house where I now, now live and the people selling it said, well, it's a nice house, you know, but it's so sad. You can't, you couldn't force a kid to grow up here, you know, and it's lots, lots of growing up in my stories yes. and lots, lots of, lots of girls growing up, even a few boys or men, even. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that and it's very close to this magical northern nature the nature is almost like a person in its own right yes, yeah nature is uh i had a question saying that nature is almost a character in your story yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's on strength and brutality, but also poetry and sweetness. Yeah. From a writer's point of view, what attracted you so much and how did you manage to describe and to, to make nature a character like this? For me, I think I, I have an, it's easier for me to describe nature than to describe a cafe in a city. You know, going to the near, when I grew up here, I actually had to walk 10 kilometers to get to the closest bus stop. That's the closest one. Oh. So, so, and then the bus has to go for an hour to get to the nearest city. So, <laughs> so it's not, it was for me, I think it came very naturally. The closeness to nature and the, the feeling more at home with the plants and the animals than actually with cars and escalators and <laughs> traffic <laughs> like the first time i came to paris i was a teenager uh, sort of running away from home and uh, i started crying i just stood on the street crying because i didn't know how to cross the street oh i had i had read all of these amazing books you know and there were all of these artists uh, 
going out drinking and painting and writing. But there was never anyone that told me in all of those books that I had read how to cross the streets. You know, I couldn't do it. And I had to go, you know, I had to capitulate and call back home and sort of. Yes, to, to go back to where you grew up and what yeah. you and that, all this noise and stuff. <laughs> But I was so much more afraid the first time I was in Paris than a few years ago when I was out walking here behind my barn in the in those woods, you can sort of see over there. Uh, and um, there was this bear that jumped out and splashed water on me. It oh. jumped out into a creek just to scare me away, I guess. It managed to scare me away. Mm -hmm. I sort of got scared, but not as scared as I was. <laughs> trying to figure out how to cross the street that was much worse <laughs> but, you know nature is something very under my skin it's always been there i grew up in it it was my my daycare center my playground mm. it was the place where i went to cry when i was sad and to hide when i was scared it's and is it yeah. the why you came back actually to your to your village? Because uh, I read that you left, and you told me that you left uh, when you were a teenager. Yeah, I I, I left uh, dreaming of you know wanting to be a poet and a writer. I left because I was told by my guidance counselor actually when I told him that I wanted to be an author that uh, I had nothing to write about, you know, you can't write because you haven't seen anything of the world. And I think it's so strange that in this debut of mine, with all the, these nine short stories, everything in them is based on things that happened before he told me I had nothing to write about. Mm -hmm. um, yes. and you and not because he said that, I just realized it later when I looked at this book and remembered him telling me that, that everything in the book is actually based on things that happened before that. But I think if I had stayed here, mm -hmm. I would never have been able to see the stories, mm -hmm. you know, because I needed to leave to actually discover this place. Like you have to zoom differently on your on, yeah. your on your on your place to have another point of view. Because when you're here every day, everything is just normal. Yeah. You know, it's just normal. It's nothing. It's a bear. It's normal to have a bear. Yeah, yeah. It's Sweet. normal. <laughs> <laughs> I ran out in, into the the garden here. Uh, when my uh, youngest daughter was uh, three years old, I was brushing her hair inside and through the window, I saw two wolves crossing my garden. And I realized my older daughter that was just 12 months older was alone outside. So I ran out and grabbed her and I wanted to tell her, you know, like, you have to come in, there's wolves outside. But, but by then they had already left. So, you know, it, <laughs> but you know, and, and still, I'm so much more scared, you know, send a four-year-old out alone into a city than out here. No. <laughs> yeah. You, it's, uh, it's a place, as you said, is a place you know where you have been yeah. raised, when you know how to interact with bears, wolves, and wolves. Yeah. It's easier with the things you know. Uh, I'm married now to uh, Peter, who works in Istanbul. Yeah, Istanbul is quite a challenge, an adventure and a challenge. <laughs> uh, I'm there like half time. I'm here half time and there half time. Um, and uh, I don't think we'll see if I ever get to the point where I can actually write something about Istanbul. Uh, I don't think I'm there yet. I don't think I understand enough, you know, get the nuances. Yes, and yeah. enough things and knowledge to write about. You're not, not sure yet. Yeah. You know, it's it takes time to get to know a place. Mm. 
Yeah, I, I think especially, um, well, I see the, your ba the background be behind you, the snow. <laughs> yeah. I think it's not totally the same uh, atmosphere in Istanbul and where you live. So I think it might take a little bit. Well, we, we don't have snow all year round. I know it's hard to believe, but, you know, we also have the midnight sun and, and 30 degrees Celsius in the summer. So... And your place is in the north, uh, the north yes. region. It's yes. Still, um, Lat 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 well, the yes. 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 This is very close. I have uh, twenty kilometers to the Lapland border. Lapland, yes. yes. I was. Yeah. So, so I'm I'm almost in Lapland. Yes, it's really north, north, north of Sweden. Yes, it's very north of Sweden. And what does the word wideness means to you? Because it's well, it's the theme of the of the fair, but it's also very up to date uh, at the moment with ecological uh, issues and protection. Does it mean something yeah. special? Um, I think many people that seek wildness seek adventure, and I I can see that as something quite strange because for me it's very much peace mm -hmm. you know uh, next week uh, I'm actually going out uh, uh, with a dog sleigh and a tent so me and the girls are gonna sleep in a tent and go dog sleighing for two days uh, and the thing I look forward to the most in that is not the dog sleighing that's mostly to get them you know to hang out and do something but sleeping in the tent in the middle of nowhere with no cell phone reception and, you know, just having that, a fire and the quiet time, it's actually getting in, in touch with oneself. Mm -hmm. uh, or if you're there with a friend or family, each other, uh, in a way that I don't think you can actually do it you can get very well in touch with someone in a cafe or, you know, I have had many wonderful dinners. It's not, but it's not these long silences where you can actually sit and listen to, to just the wind and the fire and long silences of thought where you can leave, you can be together, very together and still be very, that's for me, the wild in comparison to a city mm -hmm. in where you never have the long silences. No, never. There is always noise, always sounds, always something. Yeah. Disturbing. And you can't you can't really go to a cafe with a friend and sit there and be quiet. No. People they think you're weird. they think you're very, very weird. I've tried. You know <laughs> <laughs> sort of like yes, you've tried. So <laughs> Yes, while, while when you are outside, you can just yes look at the landscape and just say nothing. Yeah. And, uh, feeling that's that's what yeah. it means to you and why it is so important. Yeah, that's for me. It's a place for. I guess modern people would use the word meditation, but I'm not really that modern. <laughs> Yes, about modernity, you talk about modernity and in your book, I found some little winks or little signs to the, um, how would you say, fantastic and folklore yeah. aspect of uh, beliefs and even some pagan things. You are very connected to the traditions of, of your country or is it just natural or is it uh, something you really wanted to show? I think it's just happened, you know, it's, it's the world I grew up in, so it just happened to come into the text. I didn't really put it there to show something. It just, it's very, it came with the flow. And I think being up here in the north of Sweden, where there still is, although... Mm, Sami people were forbidden to practice their religion, but there are still so many remnants of the nomadic reindeer herding, uh, shamanism, mm -hmm. and also of the folklore, like 
when I grew up, there were some places where you couldn't build houses or you couldn't even uh, park your bicycle because of Vitra. Uh, and the, the Vitra is actually the people that live underground. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I see. So if, if you sort of park your bicycle there, they, it would always fall over, you know. Yeah. yeah. Or if you built a house there, it would fall down down so you couldn't do that you know and i grew up with this and it it just was a normal part of looking at nature like something that had its own soul well, yeah yeah it's just the way you see nature and how you've been yeah. growing up and uh -huh. but still i'm living in the middle of you know there there is so much uh, forestry here and not the nice friendly kind but the kind where they chop everything down and yeah so it's not like everybody shares this view yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you said you were close to lapland um is this is there a part of uh, traditions from lapland in your in your text or is it more swedish or do you or is there not big difference between both of them i think it's very fluent in between i don't even know myself which part is from um, you know my family has uh, heritage both from the sami people and the swedish people and even my mother is from northern finland uh, her father was uh, so i think it's a mix of everything mm -hmm. the influences uh, what what we and also the ones I called Vitra uh, in the Swedish, they are called uh, Saiver in uh, Sami. Okay. So they are sort of the same. It's just that Vitra has sheep, uh, Saiver has uh, reindeers, but it's sort of very similar, the things they do. And you have to keep well with them when you're fishing to get fish. Yeah, you know. The same, the same uh, powers, but with different, yeah. and different shapes. Yeah. It's the same. Yeah, the same. And which text is your favorite in your in your book? Because reading, I had a favorite one, and I thought maybe you had also a favorite one. Oh, I think I have two favorites. Uh, one is, but I don't know what they are called in French. Yeah, and I don't know the Swedish name for the French. I just can, is the one but the first French. one, the first one I mentioned to you about the mother and the daughter that plants flowers on a grave and cleans the house. Mm -hmm. That one, because it was so special to me writing about it. It's also the most, uh, the, the one that is actually most true, so to say. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this... Uh, other one, Ujura in Swedish, about a girl who goes to a party with a gift uh, that is frogs, oh, yes. living frogs. Uh, and that one is very special to me, also because I did that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't, I, I actually, I grew up very, you know, without actually knowing much about knives and forks and everything uh, and uh, I thought it was a nice gift yes uh, it is actually <laughs> well maybe, no maybe one... the kids didn't think the same no mo mostly kids and mothers uh, panicked <laughs> and threw them out oh yeah <laughs> so Okay. And my favorite in your book is the story where you talk about this little girl and these three friends and this little girl who becomes a bear, but it's ah. small. And I thought it was really, uh, you talked about uh, folklore and creatures. Yeah. And it was really an expression of the, the Swedish folklore and of this belief. And well, I think that is more surreal than folkloristic but it's also you know i think it happens to a lot of women uh sometimes being a woman you know you all of this shaving your legs and painting your face and brushing your hair and 
and then sometimes stuff happens and you can't be a little girl anymore mm -hmm. you have to be a beast mm. and uh, and then this brother takes her and makes her back into a little girl with a razor mm. uh, and uh, the thing is when I wrote that I sort of had the next chapter I still have the next chapter in my head but it's only in a few words you know uh, that he uses uh, the mother's razor and then I had this uh, in the end of my papers just written by ha by longhand why do the mother have razors is she also transforming into a bear sometimes you know <laughs> and then there was this second part of the story that I never wrote but I thought about it a lot you know maybe she is I think she is I think many of us are, but not everybody. So obviously, you know. Mm. This is a great, great idea that all women have a beast side and have razors yeah. behind it. Yeah, and that's why, why we need all of the corsets and, you know, to keep it in check, the beast. Yes. It, it was part of, I started having all of these thoughts about the fur and the wildness of you know, when writing it so yes it's a very special story uh, because you see i can even now years after writing it still have you know it gets my mind going and thinking things yes you're still yeah. thinking about what you wrote and it means yeah. it's, it keeps living in your head even if yes. you wrote the story it's still alive <laughs> I was just missed by a big lump of snow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lots of snow in your hair. It's very nice. Like, really yeah. Nice. <laughs> uh, well, I think I have, we have uh, we have been through all the the questions that I, I planned, and I really thank you for um, being there and sharing this moment with with, uh, with me and uh, with us to, for this fair. Yeah, I will say thank, thank you, you so much for having me.